For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, remember it like it was yesterday, my mother's mantra to me when I was a young child. She said, stand guard at the door of your mind. Honestly, it took me a decade plus to figure out what she was ultimately saying. Uh, but she was focused on, more than anything else, our capacity to be resilient and to meet challenges head on. Our capacity as human beings to refocus our energies, our sense of purpose, and a sense of optimism and faith that will get through times challenging, uh, times uh, like today, difficult moments that all of us are working through uh, to reconcile the world we're living in, to reconcile the need to pay our rent, our mortgage, to understand whether or not we can educate our kids at home with all of the other burdens and challenges that we face uh, within the household and, and where we're going uh, as a state and as a nation. Uh, the old adage, we're nothing but a mirror of our consistent thoughts. Whatever we tend to focus on, we find more of. And if you're like me, you're focused on the nightly news 24-7 cycle, seven days a week, there's a lot of anxiety uh, running through uh, those broadcasts, a lot of fear uh, that is induced uh, focusing on what this nation and the world is doing to meet this pandemic head on. That stress is manifest, that stress is real. And all of us work through that stress differently. Uh, no one can moralize how some people deal with it versus others. Uh, some people are coping quite well. Others are struggling, understandably. Struggling because they lost their job and they don't have a paycheck. Struggling because their kids aren't at school. Struggling uh, in ways uh, where they're having a hard time sleeping, where they're a little bit shorter, a little more irritable, uh, and they're prone. Uh, to doing things that aren't healthy. Uh, they may be drinking more than they should. I don't just mean adult beverages, high sugar drinks. They may not be uh, taking time to, to breathe. They may not even be taking time uh, to reflect uh, on, uh, on their own health uh, and the need to exercise, to hydrate, uh, and to focus uh, on reaching out and embracing uh, someone else or calling for help calling a friend and saying, you know what, can I just talk? Uh, we recognize, I recognize, we all, I think, recognize uh, the nature of this moment. And I just want folks to know that staying at home doesn't mean you're alone. That as a state, we are here to do what we can to support you uh, and to be there at a time of need. Uh, I've tasked the uh, Surgeon General of the State of California, Dr. Nadine Harris-Burke, to put together a strategy and a protocol to help support you and to support caregivers that need the peer-to-peer -peer support, a little you know, psychological first aid uh, themselves to get through the day and to continue to thrive, not just survive in terms of the workload uh, as they're taking care of people uh, all throughout the state of California. I've asked her to consider not only the physical health needs of Californians in the context of addressing the issues of this virus, but the brain health needs, the mental health. After all, the brain is part of the body, and there's nothing to be ashamed uh, by uh, recognizing uh, your own limitations in terms of the stress uh, and the angst that you may feel. In fact, there's probably no one stronger than when he or she recognizes uh, those stress points. And so we are putting out guidelines we're putting out guidance, not only uh, to our health plans in the state of California, both on the private side and on the public side, our Medi-Cal system, but we're also putting a playbook together for you, a checklist uh, as adults, as caregivers, uh, but also a checklist for our children, because everything I just said, uh, it's translated very differently into our children. Our children aren't able to communicate uh, words like this, boy, I'm completely stressed out, not a young child maybe a teenager, but not a young child. And they manifest stress very differently. Uh, they have a tummy ache. They may not be sleeping as well. They may be particularly irritable, sort of jumping back and forth. Uh, well, I explained my daughter a few weeks ago as she threw her bed over uh, because she was so upset uh, when I told her 
it's likely she wasn't going to go back to school uh, and see her friends this school year. Everybody manifests this differently, and our children are most vulnerable because uh, they're not able to communicate as effectively uh, as many of the adults and caregivers. So we have a playbook for them as well, uh, a checklist uh, for our children as well. And we have resources. Uh, we have on our covid19.ca.gov website, covid19.ca.gov website, we have 16 hotlines that we have made available, including text chat lines where people can address their particular needs as it relates to uh, domestic violence, um, intimate partner uh, battering. We're seeing increasing in times of stress and the need to get help. You can call that DV hotline. Elder abuse. Uh, we obviously have to take care of our seniors. We have a hotline for that. A child abuse. We have a hotline for that. Teens, teens feeling deep emotional stress uh, that uh, are feeling in crisis. We have teen crisis hotline. All of these things available uh, in many, many languages, up to 170 languages in some uh, instances. LGBTQ and their unique challenges across the spectrum, uh, supports, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, all of those hotlines, all of those resource sites are available on covid19.ca.gov uh, to help support you uh, during these times of needs. There's also concern, and I'll ask the doctor to come up in a second, around secondary health effects. We talk about your physical health as it relates to making sure we stay at home, we practice physical distancing, we continue to do what we must in terms of our personal hygiene, washing our hands and the like. Uh, but it's also true that stress hormones create the kind of anxiety that induces other secondary effects. It impacts your blood pressure. It impacts your heart and can increase the likelihood of a stroke. It can impact your diabetes. Uh, it can certainly uh, impact uh, your sense of well-being and depression uh, and the like. And so the secondary health impacts are a big part of what we're also looking uh, to uh, well, respond to. And that's, again, the purpose of the guidance we're putting out today uh, and the incredible work uh, that our Surgeon General has been doing to integrate the behavioral mental health side of the world and the substance abuse side of the world. She's been working for many, many weeks uh, to put together the guidance uh, that we're putting out today and to meet uh, these challenges head on and to be there and extend a hand for you at this time of great stress uh, and need. And so uh, I shouldn't uh, belabor this. Let me just ask her to come on up. Uh, and your Surgeon General, we're proud as the state of California to have our own Surgeon General, uh, but her expertise has been and continues to be trauma-informed care, uh, a world expert in this space, and she's bringing that expertise to help address uh, this moment uh, so all of us can work through that fear and anxiety as we all are capable of doing with resiliency uh, and the capacity to adapt to the moment as long as we have the support to get through this moment. With that, Dr. Burke Harris. Thank you, Governor. The actions we're all taking to slow the spread of coronavirus, physical distancing, hand washing, wearing masks and proper disinfecting are critically necessary and remain the top priority. But while we keep our physical distance, it, our social supports to maintain emotional and spiritual connection are more important than ever for our physical and mental health. The health impacts of coronavirus go beyond infection and COVID disease. It is important to recognize that stress related to the pandemic that many are feeling right now, compounded by the economic distress due to lost wages, employment, and financial assets, plus school closures and sustained physical distancing, can trigger the biological stress response, which also has an impact on our health and well-being. During times of heightened stress, our bodies make more stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol, 
And these can affect our health, our behaviors, and our emotions. Overactivity of the stress response can be associated with a variety of symptoms, some of which are familiar and others that are less well known. Familiar symptoms include changes in sleep patterns or appetite, mood changes such as anxiety, depression, or anger, an increased risk of substance use or dependence, and family violence. However, health conditions such as headache, abdominal pain, and digestive difficulties, increased blood pressure or blood sugar, asthma exacerbations, and increased risk of infection are also associated with an overactive stress response. It's important to know that these changes aren't just in your head. And to begin to identify how stress shows up for you, physically, emotionally, and behaviorally. Individuals who have a history of trauma or adversity may also be at greater risk. The good news is that there are simple ways, simple things that you can do every day at home to protect your and your family's health. Safe, stable, and nurturing relationships help to protect our brains and bodies from the harmful effects of stress and adversity. Healthy nutrition, regular exercise, mindfulness like meditation, good sleep hygiene, and staying connected to our social supports and getting mental health care all help to decrease stress hormones and improve our health. We've brought together evidence-based guidance in the Surgeon General's playbook on stress relief during COVID-19 and an additional playbook for caregivers and kids that offers practical tools and tips that you can add to your daily routine. We've also developed guidance for health plans and healthcare providers on addressing stress-related health concerns during this pandemic, including how to implement trauma-informed care and supporting provider resilience. That information is available at acesaware.org. If you are concerned about the effects of stress on your health, call your doctor or your mental health professional. And if you need help finding resources, visit the Emotional Support and Wellbeing homepage at covid19.ca.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And, and the Surgeon General will be available for questions uh, in a moment as well. Uh, I'll just remind everything, we are bigger than anything we face. And so I know the fear uh, and anxiety we all have, but let us have faith. Faith conquers all. Uh, and know that uh, this will pass, it will pass. And in that light uh, and in that spirit, let me uh, give you an update on where we are in terms of the total number of positive cases uh, in this state. And let me uh, give you uh, a sense of optimism in terms of the curve in California uh, bending. Uh, it is bending, but it's also stretching. And I want to make uh, that point uh, and that distinction uh, in a moment. But let me first just give you the updated numbers. Uh, 15,865 individuals are currently tested positive for COVID-19. That represents a 10.7% increase uh, over yesterday. Uh, hotel, or rather hospitalizations in the state of California and ICU beds, again, those are the numbers I look at first thing every morning. Uh, the hospitalization numbers went up uh, to 2,611 uh, yesterday. That's about a 4.1% increase from the previous day. ICUs went up to 1,108. That was about a 2.1% increase uh, over uh, the course of the last 24 hours. 2.1% uh, will take. Uh, of course, too many. We want to see that number go down, not up. Uh, but these are not the double-digit increases we're seeing in hospitalization rates or ICU rates uh, that we saw even a week or so ago. That's not to suggest by any stretch of the imagination uh, that we'll continue to see these declines. It's to only reinforce the importance of maintaining physical distancing and continuing our stay-at-home policy that has helped bend the curve in the state of California. But that curve continues to rise, just not at the slope 
that originally was projected without the kind of interventions, these non-pharmaceutical interventions like physical distancing have uh, provided for. So let us continue uh, in that stead, continue uh, in that spirit to meet, yes, this moment, uh, and continue to do more to practice the physical distancing and the social distancing uh, that are required. Uh, there are, fortunately, uh, now some 374 individuals that have lost their lives, 31 additional families that have a loved one that lost their lives uh, from this time yesterday. Uh, so that's the progress report in terms of the numbers. Uh, I want to remind everybody uh, that this state uh, continues to take advantage of every hour of every day, every moment, to make sure we're prepared uh, for any surge and prepared for the long haul. And I talked about the curve bending, uh, but also stretching. And that's why I just want to impress upon people. Our modeling shows uh, that we're not at peak in a week or two, uh, that we are seeing a slow and steady increase, but it's moderate. And it's moderate again because of the actions all of you have taken uh, in terms of the physical distancing. That moderate increase has allowed us to do what we did yesterday, and that was to announce the 4,613 uh, alternative care sites to help us decompress our hospital system. It's allowed us to begin to process uh, the 89 plus thousand people that have filled out the application on our Health Corps website and to begin to triage uh, individuals and their unique expertise and capacity uh, so that we can staff those alternative uh, care sites and to procure more uh, personal protective gear. And we'll have more on that tomorrow uh, as we continue to find uh, more places to source N95 masks, shields, gowns, uh, coveralls, and the like, including ventilators. I just want to say briefly, though, on the ventilators, I, I couldn't be um, more proud of the good work that my fellow governors are doing all across this country. I've had some really remarkable conversations uh, with the governors individually and as a group, um, and we couldn't be more proud as a state to be sending uh, those ventilators back east and just know uh, that the first ones will arrive in New York and New Jersey and Illinois uh, tonight. Uh, two planes are going out with those vents uh, back east and into the state of Illinois. Uh, we have four other states uh, that we will be sending uh, ventilators to as well. And I just want to thank those governors for all the good work they're doing, all the hard work they're doing, um, and the constant engagement back and forth uh, as we all are dealing with different point in time in terms of the acuity uh, of the COVID-19 response. And they are certainly uh, in those states dealing uh, with a curve uh, that puts in deep pressure on their healthcare delivery system. And we're just proud as a state because of the great work that all of you have done in slowing down that rate of growth that we're able to provide those resources uh, and confidently know that those, uh, those supports will be reciprocated uh, by those governors and by those states unquestionably uh, so. Again, the spirit of this moment and the spirit of people uh, stepping uh, up to the challenge. Uh, I want to just uh, end by saying you can step up to this challenge, as always, by going to our serve.ca.gov website, serve.ca.gov website, uh, which will allow you to match uh, your particular interests in volunteering your time. Uh, it could just be time to make calls to strangers to check in on them, uh, time to actually uh, do a little bit of volunteering at our food banks, uh, time to donate blood, uh, time uh, to uh, find uh, whatever your skill set is and to find uh, a resource guide and map on that site to help match uh, your particular expertise and willingness to help support others in your community and more broadly the state of California. So I encourage you all uh, to take out that website as well. So with that, we're happy to take any questions and talk a little bit more about the resource guides and uh, what we've put out in terms of all of these hotlines for brain health and physical health. Uh, and again, I just want to compliment and congratulate uh, our Surgeon General for all her outstanding work and her team's work to put together a very substantive guide uh, that has been deeply researched and deeply uh, considered uh, to help folks uh, deal with the very 
deep anxiety and stress that they face today. And with that, now we'll happily take some questions. Taryn Luna, LA Times. Governor, after we wrote about a peak coming in May or the beginning of a peak in May, there's been a lot of questions from readers about why the stay-at-home order wouldn't cause that peak to happen sooner, given incubation periods for the virus and that so many people have been home for the last three weeks and not out in the community spreading the virus. So I'm curious if you can explain why you guys believe the peak would still be coming in May and then also how many ventilators you expect to need at that time. Well, let me ask Dr. Galley, who's here, who's been working our models on a daily basis. We begin our morning briefs with those models, including just an hour or so ago. Dr. Galley. Thank you for the question, and thank you, Governor. Um, as the Governor said, we continue to look at those models every single day. We match them up, not just with, the, with what the model says, but we're at what we're actually experiencing on the ground in our hospitals and our ICUs. And we know that the bending or flattening of the curve means two things. It means our peak comes down, but it also goes further out. So when we hear about the various models suggesting that April is the time when we see that peak or really that peak rate of surge, we know that our efforts, and congratulations to all the Californians who are rowing with us in that direction to flatten the curve, that it makes a difference and that we move that lower and further out. So our thinking around May and late May in particular means that, that um, it follows this idea of flattening. So it's not just the reduction down, it's moving it out. The governor said it eloquently just a moment ago, and that is exactly what those models show. In terms of your question about how many ICU beds that we might need, we know that we started with roughly 10,000 in that number of ventilators, and we know that we're looking to get somewhere between an additional 15 and 20 more to reach about 25 to 30,000 ventilators in the state of California. And we know that we don't need that at this moment, we, we see and are in communication with our hospitals on a very regular basis to ensure that they have the ventilators on hand to take care of the patients who are coming through their doors. But we anticipate needing those down the road in next month and in the month of June. And, uh, and I'll remind, uh, Taryn, just remind you, yesterday I made uh, a announcement that may not have been picked up by everybody, but. Uh, because of the great work that's been done by our hospitals, again, all 416 hospitals within the state of California, they had originally assessed an inventory of 7,587 ventilators. Uh, they came back after repurposing, refurbishing, uh, and doing even more work to get ventilators within the system from, without, uh, from outside of the system. They now have an inventory of 11,036. And by the way, that number is dynamic as they're ordering ventilators uh, from sources all across the country and around the world as well. In addition, as you know, uh, we had originally uh, estimated, not estimated, we initially announced that we had 4,252 ventilators that we had secured in the state of California. A lot of those needed to be refurbished. We've talked a lot about uh, how they've gotten refurbished. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we have sourced uh, a few thousand ventilators that are on their way that have been procured, checks have been cut, uh, and we'll be receiving uh, the first shipment uh, early this week. And that, for all of those reasons, uh, we felt we were well positioned to make the contribution uh, and lend those 500 ventilators to those states most in need. Uh, so that was the determination because we feel we're adequately resourced for the moment. Again, in a dynamic world where things can change, but we're confident uh, that the number of ventilators that we currently have in possession are adequate to the task in the very short term. Kathleen Renane, AP. Hi, Governor. So I have a question about the 500 ventilators that we loaned uh, yesterday. I just want to be clear on um, exactly what role California played in deciding um, where they would go. The vice president yesterday um, said in the, in the White House briefing, he laid out states they would go to. He did not mention New York, New Jersey, um, and Illinois. He may have just misspoke, but I'm wondering, you know, did we play any role at all in deciding where those ventilators would go? Uh, we did. 100 going to New York, 100 going to New Jersey, 100 going to Illinois. 
the vice president was correct. Ventilators are going to D.C., Delaware. Uh, ventilators are going to Maryland and likely Nevada. Uh, so that was the determination. It was done uh, through the collective wisdom of our partners at FEMA. And I will remind you, we have extraordinary partnership with FEMA, uh, both from the acting director, Peter Gaynor, uh, and our regional uh, director, Bob Fenton. It was done in collaboration uh, with their expectation and needs of what is required of the moment on the ground uh, based upon that data and that collaborative engagement. We made those terminations working together, uh, including with the vice president and his task force. Alejandro Lazo, Wall Street Journal. Hi, thank you. Um, trying to get a bit of clarity on the uh, on the uh, number of open hospital beds that there are statewide, uh, not just the total that the uh, system could handle. Is it uh, thousands? Are we talking about tens of thousands of open hospital beds that are available to uh, COVID-19 uh, patients? We know that LA County has uh, had about 1,600 hospital beds, including 300 ICU beds available yesterday. But we'd really like to know statewide. Can you tell us how many statewide beds are open right now? We just think that's a very critical number. Yeah, well, we've done an amazing job. I asked Dr. Galley to fill in the blanks on that. Uh, the hospital system has done a remarkable job at decompressing their own system uh, at a great cost. Uh, to the hospital system, uh, economic cost. Uh, but they have done a remarkable job at slack, and that is reducing the number of elected surgeries. Uh, trauma uh, is down because the ED uh, uh, numbers are down, and as a consequence, uh, they have prepared. So we have the surge numbers, which you're right to reference, and then we have the slack, the availability within the existing footprint of those 75,000 licensed beds. Uh, those numbers change on a daily basis. You reference Los Angeles County, and might as well ask the former head of that county health department, uh, our HSS secretary, to uh, fill in more details about the statewide numbers. So again, thank you for raising what is uh, increasingly an important number, which is a slack in the system, meaning those beds that are available now to us that might not have been if the hospitals as a collective hadn't done a number of the things that the governor has mentioned and that he has urged them to do to prepare for COVID-19 surge. We know that in each region that there are hundreds if not thousands of beds available. We are working closely with the big systems to track that on a regular basis to try to get that number so we can quantify it. We don't have a clear estimate um, statewide as that number. I think you've mentioned the LA County number that has hovered between 14 and 1600 on a regular basis and that's in the collective hospital hospital system within that region. We expect that a number of hospitals are doing the same in terms of collecting that information and that that number um, will be made available, not just to the public, but is very important to us for our planning purposes. When the governor speaks about the need for 50,000 total beds to handle surge, we must account for those slack bed capacity. And it's not just available beds, meaning a bed that's available in a room, it also has to take into account the staffing that's available to manage a patient in that bed, as well as all of the equipment, including PPE, that goes with it. So all of that must come together to nuance that total bed number in order for us to feel confident that that's a space a patient can go during our surge planning processes. Next question. Jeremy White, Politico. Governor, thanks as always. Um, I have a question about how this is playing out across the state. Obviously, California is a very big place and um, a lot of different geographical and political regions there. We're hearing that folks, particularly in more rural parts of the state, the Central Valley, are more resistant to some of these restrictions. Um, Congressman Nunes was criticizing you again today about this. I'm just curious to know, you know, has that made it more difficult to have a uniform response across the state? And are you seeing sort of pockets of resistance? I mean, you certainly do. And that it doesn't help if everybody's not on the same page. We've been um, enlivened by the spirit uh, of collaboration and cooperation broadly across the state of California. Uh, and uh, I've been impressed. Uh, but I've also 
uh, made the point, not only have I been impressed, but it's demonstrable, it's exampled in the hospitalization numbers, in the ICU numbers, that it has helped us bend the curve. So I want to impress upon people the importance, the imperative of continuing uh, physical distancing and not taking their foot off the pedal, not taking things for granted, not slacking uh, in terms of their own behavior, uh, and not getting cabin fever, which, trust me, is the reason we made the announcement today with our Surgeon General, because we recognize those anxieties that people are facing. Uh, but most of the parts of the state are doing a fantastic job. Uh, but there are some pockets, uh, not just in rural parts of the state, but some coastal parts of the state. And I will make this crystal clear. The expectation is with the uh, weather now turning and uh, sun beginning to shine more brightly uh, and things warming up, that there will be uh, ongoing pressures on our beaches and our state parks, and so we'll have to be vigilant. Uh, but all of this is being monitored, and uh, to your question, forgive me again the long-windedness, yes, we're seeing some of that, but let me continue to focus on the overwhelming majority of people, regardless of political stripes or geographic uh, uh, considerations that have really met this moment. David Lightman, McClatchy. Thank you very much. Um, Governor, I know that EDD has been beefing up staffing and you've been trying to help it with staffing, but we are getting calls and texts saying people simply cannot even get through on the phone or email uh, before they can even file for benefits. Phones, for example, are manned only four hours a day. So what specific additional steps can you take to be responsive to people in this situation? Well, specifically to benefits, we've done surge staffing, our UI benefits now total 2.3 million people have filed uh, unemployment insurance claims. Uh, they did immediate restaffing by adding additional 200 personnel. They have now 800 on top of that uh, that are available to be redeployed. They're still within the uh, framework of being able to turn those UI benefits around within the old three-week uh, framework, and that continues to be our goal despite this unprecedented surge. As it relates to other uh, forms or other areas where people are contacting state government, uh, to the extent someone's open just four hours a day uh, for critical services, I I'll have to learn more about that. There are federal programs uh, where we're hearing uh, that claims management is being overwhelmed, websites are collapsing. Uh, certainly within the state, uh, we're trying in real time to improve uh, our capacity to deliver. Uh, but I know just on the small business side of things, uh, those systems have uh, been substantially impacted by call volume. Uh, and obviously, we all have to do more and do better uh, to meet uh, the increased inquiries and the increased applications. Alexi Kozef, SF Chronicle. Hey, Governor. Um, I wanted to return to your announcement from Friday about uh, the hotel rooms for um, unsheltered people. Uh, you had previously spoken about wanting to get everyone who's unsheltered into a homeless room, uh, a hotel room in the state. Uh, but on Friday, you spoke about only 15,000 uh, hotel rooms. So is the goal, is your goal still to get every unsheltered person into a hotel room during this pandemic? And if not, what has the plan shifted to? Well, Lexi, respectfully, I don't recall saying we had a plan to get 108,000 people. That's the current census of people that are unsheltered in the state of California immediately off the streets. Uh, that's, again, the number of unsheltered, the total number of homeless in the last census count uh, that was done last January uh, is 151. Thousand individuals. What we did say is there's a subset of vulnerable Californians out on the streets and sidewalks that would be our top priority. And that total number was in the 50 to 60,000 range. And that's when we launched this effort uh, to prioritize uh, our homeless. We talked about those trailers uh, and we talked about the program to begin to get occupancy agreements for motels and hotels all up and down the state of California. Uh, as you may have seen uh, when we announced Project Room Key, 
That was a subset of our overall homeless strategy. It was specific and prescriptive to a FEMA reimbursed program for 15,000 units. I can say this, we are over halfway there in terms of signing up those rooms. 7,643 of those rooms now have been secured and we're bringing people in uh, on a daily basis, an hourly basis, and it can't happen soon enough. But again, we need to do that with county participation and county partners. So that was the specific subset the 15,000, the total overlay of goals that encourage, that is being encouraged uh, through the good work of our local partners is in that 50 plus thousand range. Let me now tell you why I expect uh, that number uh, to be met. Uh, we provided $800 million in emergency aid to our cities, counties, and our CACs. Uh, the award letters have gone out uh, on over $800 million of aid, the $150 million the legislature just approved and the $650 million that finally is getting out from last year's uh, budget. That should substantially aid local efforts above and beyond Project Room Key to secure sites, to get people out of their encampments, to get people off the streets and to get people out of congregate settings where they may be vulnerable, both because staff may be uh, um, impacted by COVID-19 or individual uh, clients in those shelter systems. So look, it's a stretch goal. No one's naive. This is unprecedented. And let me say this as a point of pride, there's not a state in America that's even put a plan together to get 15,000 rooms. There's not a state that's gotten the support of FEMA to reimburse 75% of that. And I'm very proud of those efforts, very proud of the work that's being done at the county level. And you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to do more and we need to see this happen with a deeper sense of urgency. I get it. Uh, and there's only so much that we can do uh, from the state. We have to manifest this at the local level and local partnerships are critical to make this happen. Tanu Henry, California Black Media. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Surgeon General. Um, early signs are showing that, or indicating that the pandemic is actually affecting African-Americans more um, in cities like Detroit, Chicago, um, now D.C., and uh, even Milwaukee. And I'm, I'm checking to see if there's anything you can do um, to, collect, to start collecting racial data. Um, I know there have been some calls in um, Los Angeles, and there's also been calls from Elizabeth Warren, um, Senator Warren, and uh, Congresswoman Presley. So is there anything we can do to start to collect racial data to see if that's the case here in California? Yeah. And probably if there are broader implications around the country? No, I, I appreciate that question, and I think it's uh, one of the most important questions that have been asked in the last few weeks, uh, and that is we, we see the world uh, through uh, a different lens. One size does not fit all. Uh, we see the world through a bottom-up lens, culturally competent lens. We need to meet people where they are. And as a consequence, the answer to your question is yes, we're disaggregating the data to break things down, both on hospitalizations, uh, ICUs, and uh, in terms of uh, death rates. And we have gotten preliminary data back on that. We're still waiting for all of the data before I make it public and present it. I want it to be accurate, but that is being broken down in real time. Let me then extend a point of consideration. We need to do the same as it relates to testing because the disparities on testing are a point of obvious and real concern to make sure that all communities in the state of California uh, are being tested, not just some, uh, not just people that have a capacity to fill out uh, an online application uh, and get triaged at one of these drive-by testing sites or someone that has a primary care physician, an outstanding uh, health plan uh, that is prioritized in uh, to that system to get a PCR test, uh, but to make sure we're in East Palo Alto, East LA, Oak East Oakland, uh, and other parts of this state and making sure that we do justice uh, to the prism uh, as it relates to race, uh, ethnicity, as well uh, as making sure geographic considerations are met. Uh, I don't know the Surgeon General wants to fill in the blank a little bit more, but this has been quite literally the cost of her life. 
it, thank you, Governor. The thing that I would add is a recognition uh, that a couple of things. Number one, there was unfortunately a terrible rumor circulating that for some reason African Americans don't get coronavirus. That rumor is completely false and it's really important for all of us to get out there in debunking that rumor. One of the pieces that we also recognize is that because of the, the true an unfortunate history of medical maltreatment of different groups of people, but especially African Americans in the United States. There are real issues of trust between the African American community and the healthcare system. And that's why it's really important for all of us and all of our communities to distribute these messages through our trusted elders, through our trusted messengers within the communities, our faith communities, our pastors, whomever uh, folks recognize uh, can be trusted messengers to make sure that folks truly are heeding the life-saving message that we need to stay home, save lives, and practice physical distancing. This is true in our communities of color, uh, in our tribal communities, and other communities where we recognize that uh, some of the messaging that's coming specifically from our public health infrastructure needs the help and support of our trusted messengers within our communities. Thank you. Thank you. The log, Sacramento B. Hi, Governor. I'm wondering if you um, can give us an update on your uh, efforts that you announced over the weekend on testing. Um, have you guys been able to dramatically ramp up testing as uh, you said you wanted to? And are there plans to start using uh, that antibody test more widely? Yeah, so we're at 157,800 tests. Uh, that we have conducted in the state. We're starting to see these things ramp up. As I said, it won't be a couple days where we'll be getting to 25,000 tests on a daily basis. It will be over the course of the next few weeks. So uh, I feel confident uh, in what we announced and what is being advanced, what is happening all across the state with our task force and the good work that they're doing. Uh, part of that work includes, as you suggest, the uh, partnership with Stanford University, serology tests, uh, and moving to blood-based tests, and those now are continuing uh, on pace. I don't want to over-promise. Uh, we're going to start small, but you'll see incremental uh, improvements in uh, that uh, testing modality as well. So not just PCR, swab-based tests, but blood-based tests are now part of the protocols that are being advanced uh, within the state of California. And yes, Stanford did get uh, the FDA approval for that homegrown state of California Stanford medicine test. Angela Hart, Kaiser Health News. Thank you, Governor. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question about inequality. Um, there's great concern, I think, across California that um, nothing, not faith or, you know, relief efforts that have been taken thus far have really done enough to help, um, you know, people who are, who are forced to work. So I just wanted to ask you, what is your message to the working poor and, um, working class people across California, you know, many of whom are more vulnerable today, um, who don't really have the option to not go to work. Well, look, I mean, these are, this has been the cause of, uh, I think, of all of our lives. Uh, those that I, I have uh, assembled around me as part of the team, they have one thing in common, and that's a deep desire uh, to uh, make real our promotion and promise to to take care of people that are desperate and take care of people in need. It's the lens to which we see the world. It's the top priority of this administration to, issue, to address the issue of poverty in all of its forms and manifestations. And so uh, we have, over the course of the last year that I've been in office, gone to great lengths to uh, support our safety net uh, and enhance it with our earned income tax credit and other proposals to uh, make work pay uh, and to make sure that people have a quality health care. And that continues even at this moment to make sure those working poor uh, that are essential workers that still have to be out there are being protected in the workplace. Uh, we have Julie Sue, the Department uh, of Labor, uh, that comes from uh, an advocacy uh, perspective that came into this position, who is 
always looking at abuses of workers and people that are being mistreated as a top priority of enforcement. She's not walking away from enforcement despite this crisis. She wants to continue aggressively to enforce. And by the way, uh, that also uh, goes to the issue that uh, we led with today, and that is making sure uh, that people that are in vulnerable households, vulnerable uh, to uh, violence, uh, child abuse, uh, domestic violence, uh, that we're not giving up even on uh, making sure we do home visits, not just telehealth, which is a big part of our overall guidance and efforts, but to make sure uh, that we protect the most vulnerable in those conditions as well. So it extends across the panoply. Good enough never is, uh, but no, uh, that's deeply a part of our agency uh, focus and deeply a part of this administration's priority. Marisa Kendall, Bay Area News Group. Thank you. I wanted to ask um, another question about testing. I was hoping you could give us a little bit more details on your overarching strategy in terms of who you're trying to get tested. Um, are you hoping to test, you know, everyone who meets a certain criteria, for example, or universal testing of everyone, or is there another group of people um, you're hoping to prioritize for testing? I, and, and forgive me, and, and, and I'll ask Dr. Angel to come up in a moment to talk more specifically. We laid out in detail exactly the prioritization uh, for testing in the state. We talked about uh, the existing partnerships uh, and how we prioritize those from a clinical care perspective that are hospitalized, how we prioritize by extension our healthcare workers and first responders, how we prioritize uh, in the next iteration and phase the kind of community surveillance that can teach us more about antibodies and immunity issues. And so that was uh, the framework. But I'll ask Dr. Angel, and I only refer to that because uh, you can see those guidelines, part of the task force we put out. Uh, but Dr. Angel it happens to be here, and she can fill in the blanks a little bit more as well. Thank you, Governor. Um, testing is an essential part of the providers' needs to understand patients and make critical decision making decisions at the time of treatment. Because right now we do have limitations on testing, we need to make sure that that testing is used in the most effective way to save lives and to help prevent those that may be uh, working in our care delivery system from having further problems with their own health or potentially spreading disease to other people. So in short, when we talk about testing at this time, we recommend that the testing goes to those who are in the hospital who may be ill. We recommend prioritizing those who perhaps are considering uh, the need that for entering the hospital to make sure that their care is managed best. And then also making sure that those individuals who are frontline responders, those who we all rely upon to take care of us when we get ill, making sure that the tests get to them. As tests become more available, of course, we want to make them available more broadly. But in general, if you at home have symptoms, if you are not in a high risk group, meaning that you are not older do not have comorbidities, or if your symptoms are just mild, like the uh, little bit of shortness of breath, perhaps a cough, then we recommend you call your provider first, talk to them about it, and in general, many of you may not need a test. Many of you will do quite well at home, certainly in contact with your care provider, until your symptoms resolve. So at this time, prioritization of testing is going to those for whom it can make the greatest uh, change or influence in their outcomes, and as we open up testing more broadly, we'll make sure that they're available to Californians across, across the country, particularly through the important task force that we're developing to help really make tests more broadly available. Thank you. And um, I'll remind everybody as well, we've got uh, those 75 sites from Abbott Laboratories working with 13 of our hospital systems. These are the point of care tests uh, that now are finally being distributed uh, across the country, but also here in the state of California, that allow five to 15 minute results. Uh, so that's good news as well as we turn the corner. And I'll also remind you, uh, it has not changed anything in terms of our approach to meeting uh, our responsibility to provide for the surge plan, to provide the appropriate level of personal protective equipment and secure as much as we can find. And in addition to that, make sure that we have the appropriate level of staffing uh, in terms of our broader pandemic planning. So we're looking forward uh, to those tests increasing 
exponentially, uh, and I have confidence in the task force work uh, that will meet those goals that were stated just a few days ago. Melissa Perlman, CBS 13. Hi, Governor. How are you? With one million Californians out of work, uh, how many people have been placed or applied for jobs through Onward California at this point? Yeah, it's interesting. I asked that question this morning, and they're getting me that data. Um, and uh, and now uh, they're all listening to this, so they're going to get it for both of us sooner than you can imagine. And I thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Onward .ca, or Onward CA. Uh, .gov was put together in partnership with Salesforce, LinkedIn, and Bitwise to match in four key categories, open job listings uh, with those that recently lost work or are actively looking for work, primarily in the healthcare industry, logistics, uh, and the grocery uh, industry. Uh, and we had, last count, just shy of 100,000 job openings uh, that were available. Uh, they prompt questions so people could figure out their wage preferences, their geographic uh, desire in terms of proximity to work where those jobs are opened, uh, and other skill sets that are part of that uh, larger website. It's one of many, and I just want to make this point, it's one of many job matching sites that are part of the overall uh, California strategy. You have local efforts, county efforts, you've got regional and statewide efforts. Uh, all of those uh, are being organized, so that's not the exclusive site. It's just the most aggregated site uh, and one that we're encouraging people to access, but we'll get you those numbers. They should be coming back very, very soon. Final question, Adrian Florido, NPR. Uh, thank you. Uh, Governor, a number of uh, state legislators are calling on you to establish an emergency fund to provide uh, direct payments to undocumented immigrants who, who um, are obviously left out of the federal relief bill. Uh, what do you think of that request, and is that something you, um, you're going to do? We've been talking to the legislature. We've been working overtime uh, on our budget. I've got this, what we call California, the May revise uh, that is on my desk. Uh, and we are uh, working through those issues, I-10 issues, those in mixed status families that are not beneficiaries of some of the federal stimulus dollars, the CARES Act dollars. Uh, that also is a criteria of real concern for us. Uh, and obviously, uh, as Californians caring deeply about undocumented uh, residents in this state uh, to provide supports for those individuals as well. So the answer is yes, all of that is being considered all part of a broader package uh, where I'll be making some significant adjustments to the January budget proposal and advancing at the same time some economic stimulus strategies at a state level, not just waiting for the federal government to do that for us. Well, with that, thank you all as always for uh, your spirited questions. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, and thank you all for availing yourselves to the resources we announced today. Uh, if you are feeling lonely, if you are feeling sad, if you're feeling depressed and anxious, if you are fearful, uh, if you know somebody that is, please check out our covid19.ca.gov website. Please take a look at the resources we have put out, uh, the checklists that we have put out. Uh, please consider uh, sharing that information to people you care about and loved ones. And as always, reach out to people. If there was ever a time when you, you, know, you wanted to call Aunt Margie and you, know, you hadn't called her in two years, this is the time. Uh, if ever you want to introduce yourself to one of your neighbors, uh, make yourself available and get in contact. I, I had a beautiful letter. I'm not even making this up. I'll close with this. It was sitting there at the gate uh, of my home uh, right outside, uh, and there was this little note attached from a neighbor down the block who just wanted to put in a good word. Uh, just dropping a note by. Made my day. Look at me. I'm, you know, made my week. Um, you can do the same. Uh, reach out to your neighbors. Reach out to loved ones. Reach out to strangers. Continue to do great work. Practice physical distancing. Let's bend this curve and let's get beyond this uh, light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you all. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus.